Hey everyone, welcome back to the Adventures Let's Travel podcast. My name is John Schwenk. My guest today is an ice core scientist at the University of Alberta, where she's also the director of the Canadian Ice Core Lab, on top of being a National Geographic Explorer and a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. She's a co-founder of Girls on Ice Canada and has conducted first-hand research in some of the most remote parts of the planet. On top of that all, she was also part of the first all-female team to summit Pinnacle Peak in the Indian Himalayas and has done more excursions and adventures than I can count. She's also done some bikepacking tours in the Arctic. She loves the cold. Dr. Allison Crisitello, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. So you are an ice core scientist. So I think not many people know exactly what that is, but you gave me a very valuable resource. It's the two... Read it? Uh, the two mile time machine. I did. It's it's great. Dr. Richard B. Alley. He simplifies things in a very digestible, uh, easy to understand manner. Um, but I would love to hear from you. What exactly is an ice core, and what do you do? Okay. Um, I love that you picked that book up. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I, in general, ice core scientists go out to places where there's ice that's, you know, been around for a long time, preserving climate signals. And we, we drill down into the ice, we drill these cores, um, and then, you know, we, we date them, we, we put an age scale onto them. And then that allows us to look at all sorts of different things about the environment over time. It lets us look, look at climate into the past. Cool. And so the interesting thing about ice cores specifically is or I guess coring, is it's not specific to ice, which is something I didn't really think of. So you could core a tree, and then that way you don't have to cut the tree in half. You could take a core, and you can look that way. You could do you could uh, look at lake sediment, right? So what is some of the, um, the active research that you're doing? Like what, when you go out, and your most recent expedition to Mount Logan, which was, I think, this past uh, fall... When you go out on these kinds of trips, what exactly are you trying to accomplish from a scientific standpoint? Yeah, good question. I guess the answer is different every single time we go out, depending on the location and the questions we, we think we're going we're going to ask. Um, so, and also just to say that you are exactly right that paleoclimate records, records of climate in the past, don't just exist in in the cryosphere in the frozen parts of the planet. Um, uh, lake sediment cores, like you mentioned, and also tree rings, coring trees are two of the very best other ways to look at climate of the past. Um, there are things about ice cores that are particularly unique. Um, but, but anyhow, to answer your sort of the second half of that, it, it's sort of different everywhere we go. Um, and, and that depends on a lot of different things from Mount Logan, um, the project that you're talking about that we completed last year, or we, we at least completed a field component of, we're in the middle of all the analysis. Um, I guess the, the big broad question there was, was it, you know, can we, can we locate and drill what may be the oldest non-polar Arctic ice on earth? Um, we, we think that the oldest non-polar Arctic ice sits up on Mount Logan summit plateau for a number of reasons. And, and, and the reason it's very valuable to get that record, um, and this is a, a tens of thousands of years long record um, from somewhere like Mount Logan, the top of a mountain that's not in the polar regions, um, is because it contains this alluring potential of telling us something that we couldn't learn somewhere else. It's something we couldn't learn from an Arctic or an Antarctic core because of where Mount Logan sits on the planet. Interesting. So. Now, to that point, what makes research in Antarctica or the Arctic or where you are from a, um, like, why would you go to one or the other? I mean, you just mentioned Mount Logan, but like for, for the polar regions, like what makes one, because I'm pretty sure from what I've read, like you would go to different, that you would go to Antarctica versus going to the Arctic for like very different reasons, right? Um, I guess it's, it's a little complicated because 
in some ways, um, ice cores capture information that's global. For example, the gases that are in the atmosphere at any given point that then get trapped um, deep di down in the ice once once these bubbles are closed off from your current atmosphere. Um, the signal that that you you know sort of read in the gases in an ice core in the Arctic and the Antarctic may be similar. Um, so there's sort of this there's global information that they can capture, um, but there's also a lot of local information that's captured by an ice core. So to have a really long record, tens of thousands of years long, um, where Mount Logan is. Mount Logan is you know, in the corner of the Yukon, it's just off the Gulf of Alaska, like sticking out in the North Pacific. And it's, you know, it's a record of North Pacific climate variability. There's a lot of, of local and regional information that's being captured by the ice there that say an Arctic or Antarctic, um, I, you know, ice core, glacier, wouldn't be able to tell us. Another kind of cool example, I guess I, my PhD work was very focused on the Antarctic and it was sort of really regional. I was looking at a specific part of West Antarctica in a specific bay, seeing like very specifically what was being recorded, um, you know, and like whether we could reconstruct sea ice in that area, looking at the ice core. Um, so, you know, there's this really local information that's also captured. Sure. And, and uh, um, so I guess for people that are still kind of have no idea what we're talking about. So the, and I, I am by no means an expert. I, I say that like I like I know what I'm talking about. But so from from what I've gleaned about all this is generally ice over millennia, ice or, or snow will will fall onto the surface and then it'll get compacted into ice. And then it every every year, every decade, every century, every millennia, that just keeps adding on and on and on. But then there's various uh, periods throughout the Earth's history that either warm it or, or it's or it's you know un, unusually colder, and so that affects how compact the snow is, or sorry, how compact the ice is, and then so by drilling a core, you're it's essentially like a time series, uh, you know, uh, structure that you can you can get you can pretty much collect the data off of to determine how does that play into the rest of the environmental variables that are going on from what we know, right? So it's just a way to kind of collect more data to prove or disprove some of these like climate change uh, models, right? That was, that was a pretty decent summary. Um, okay. I tried. I gave it my best. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I should say too, um, there's sort of two general branches of ice core scientists and I'm, I'm really a, a liquid chemist. I look at yeah, you know, take the actual ice itself and melt it, look at the liquid chemistry of what's in there. Um, but some people look solely at the gases, the little bubbles of ancient atmosphere that are trapped in the ice. And and both both let us look at all sorts of different things in the past. Um, and we we often, you know, cores like the Logan core, ultimately probably we will do both. We'll do the liquid chemistry and gas analysis. Um, but yes, that's right. I mean. Yeah, the, the whole principle and why this sort of works is that snow in places that are, you know, cold enough for long enough um, and see little to hopefully no summer melt where where you can sort of lose some of your record, um, you know, snow compacts to fern, which is just this intermediary state of compact snow and then eventually into ice, which is technically where bubble close off happens where the those bubbles no longer are connected by air between spaces. They're they're independent of each other. That's technically where it becomes ice, and and then it just keeps getting buried and buried. So, um, as long as nothing disturbs the layering, right? The stratigraphy, that layering, um, then we're able to to date by various different methods to date the ice, and then say different things about climate in the past. But there are in fact a lot of things that mess up layering, which is why we. Um, we gen generally spend a whole season before we drill ice cores going out and using radar systems to to look at the layering from from the surface all the way down to the bedrock to make sure that it's hopefully datable ice. Sure. Okay. So then, on that note, how does uh, the actual process of collecting data when you're when you're at the when you're actually at the actual site, you drill 
is it actually two miles or is that just a nice easy number for for the book um gosh i can't remember was does he use the waist divide ice core as the example uh, Cause, cause, yeah it's like i i can't well because i can't remember to be totally we, honest. we drill all sorts of depths but the deep deepest ice coring projects in the world are very deep yes okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, because matt I, I guess we should have mentioned this mount logan is the tallest mountain in canada or in Mount Logan's the tallest mountain in Canada, the second highest in North America. Um, it's just shy of, of Denali. Um, and the, the ice on the summit plateau of Logan, there's in this sort of broad plateau area is actually over 400 meters deep. Um, the site that we selected to drill at was 327 meters deep. Oh, oh okay. So, so it's, uh, you get this ch big chunk of ice out of the, out of the earth. How do you go from big chunk of ice to data that you can actually analyze? Oh, it's many months. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, so we, we drill in one meter sections and right. uh, this particular drill, we do a lot of the intermediate depth drilling with is a 82 millimeter diameter. So you've got these 82 millimeter diameter, one meter long segments, like 327 of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> once we get them safely frozen back to the ice core lab, um, we design a, a cut plan. So basically, you know, you just, you look at a, a circle and we decide, okay, here's, here's our primary analyses that we want to do. Here's what we secondary analyses we want to be able to do. And then here's how much ice we want to archive for the future. Um, and then we, we physically cut on a series of band saws that I have in a minus 25 C freezer. Um, we physically cut those cylinders into many different pieces um, and some of those will get sort of subsampled, um, you know, vertically, but the, the sort of most precious <laughs> inner center piece, the piece that's never seen, it hasn't seen the air since it was, you know, deposited, it hasn't touched <laughs> anything, that very center of the core is what we use for the elemental analyses. And so we measure, um, if you name it, any element, we probably measure it. Um, <laughs> And we also simultaneously look at the stable isotopes, the, the isotopes of oxygen, which is how we get temperature out of ice. Oh, okay. Temperature records. Um, and we measure major ions as well. So um, marine aerosols, things that come from the ocean and sea spray and get blown up onto ice caps and glaciers. Um, and so all of this is a huge amount of data we can gather actually just from that center stick, this little two centimeter by two <laughs> centimeter center stick. The rest is all dedicated to other things. Um, for the Logan core itself, the, the cut plan um, has a, a stick that's that's going to be used for wildfire analysis. So um, we'll be looking at not just sort of changes in frequency of wildfires over time, but also um, changes in what vegetation was burning over time, which is something we can we can now do. Um, and, and and the reason being because the the chemical structure of those compounds doesn't really change based off of like it's and I, my chemistry knowledge is so limited so you got to forgive me here I'm a I'm a stats guy not a science guy but the uh, the chemical like the the way that the actual molecules are structured that's never going to change so when you look hundred thousand years ago if it has that some kind of like uh like a wildfire marker some yeah, sort of right sugar. yeah like like it should it should be the same whether it's a hundred thousand years ago or last year in theory yeah we there are some things that we care about over time like some things can degrade in time some things can migrate in time if the temperatures are below freezing but not far below freezing so there are okay. some there are some places and some concerns where you yeah you, know, you have to think through these things but sure. um but yes in general what you just said is true yeah okay yeah um so in the greater climate conversation i guess mm -hmm. um there's a lot there's a lot of people with so many different competing interests and so many different uh perspectives and a lot of them have very valid points for various uh, sides of the coin. Now, what exactly can you take from the ice core research 
and how can you kind of how can you use what you extract from the ice cores to paint a picture that maybe allows those who don't understand it as fully to mm. get a better understanding because i think the idea of having a a timeline and having a time series of data is fairly intuitive right but then there's so it's a dynamical mm -hmm. system so there's so many moving parts and there's so mm -hmm. many different factors that for the layman for lack of a better term like they don't it, it's hard it's hard to fully understand that just because it's not their their niche right i mean i work in finance so like people don't <laughs> really understand inflation so that that's like a concept <laughs> where you know there's so many different things that affect it right so how how can you take what you do from a research standpoint and how can you kind of convey that to like your grandparents or some or maybe your grandparents are ice scientists that's a bad example but like no. <laughs> someone who doesn't really understand this area and the yeah, impact that's, on the climate i mean specifically. honestly that's probably the most important question and the truth is too that i mean you know what i do is very niche right i do I, i'm an ice core scientist and and even within that tiny field i do a very specific thing so <laughs> yeah, yeah. um yeah so we're all a little bit myopic i guess but like uh I think the best answer to this question is looking at the IPCC report. The International Panel for Climate Change, which every several years, the smartest scientists in the world get together and basically write a state of the earth report on what is going on in every part of the earth system and make a summary for policymakers and um, a summary that anybody can read. Um, and you know you can you can look in depth at the chapters as much as you want or just sort of check out the summary pieces. but um, it is not a political document. It is it is just a state of science, a state of the earth, the state of where we're at and some some various paths forward and and what they might look like. Um, and the current IPCC report um, that came out pretty recently um, does a really, a really clear and wonderful job, I think, of taking the current state of science, which includes a lot of, you know, just it's just a basic review of all the current um, science, including ice core science, um, and says, you know, in a in a 1.5 degree C warming world, first two, um, what's the difference? What, what what does that look like and what should our target be and why? Um, and there really is no question, uh, zero question. There should be no question among anyone who decides to review the science themselves um, that the ag like, truly absolute maximum warming that we should be able, that we should be, be looking at is 1.5. Um, yeah, and so I think I'm not like I'm not uh, involved in the writing of the IPCC report, um, but I I think that's the very best resource that we have. Yeah, it I that's the first time I've heard of that personally, but I, I think mm. the idea of it is is really important because there's a lot of it's imp it's one important to keep politics out of it. It's too yeah. important to um, have paths forward like you said like okay this is what's happening but what like what give me some concrete actionable items that we can do and then i think the third part which i guess i won't know until i read it but being able to kind of take the criticism of what is presented and being mm -hmm. able to reiterate and, and constantly improve because if i i think a, a lot of times people get into these kind of echo chain and Every industry, yes. not just this industry, but they get into these echo chambers where they're only listening to their own ideas. That's and right. so whenever someone is a dissenter, they just, they treat them as like, they don't know what they're talking about. But there's a lot of very valid points for all sides, right? Take climate as an example, like fossil fuel companies do keep us warm and they do provide us power. So if that's going to be, if, if we do want to move forward, we need to find a way where all sides of, everyone has representation at the table and everyone's f has the freedom to speak up and not feel, you know, like, oh, no one's going to take me seriously because they're all their ideologues or whatever. Right. But totally. I mean, I think that's yeah, that's just you totally hit the nail on the head. Like it's not <laughs> a it's not a political issue. Um, right. And I think when I do get asked about in general questions about climate change and 
um, sort of the broader implications of the kind of work I do. I think it's really important to get across. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't even, I don't think do a great job communicating my science yet. I'm working on it, but, but I, you know, I'm just here to, to report the science that I'm doing, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. All right. Well, that is all the politics I'm ever going to talk about on this, po- on this podcast. So not bad, not for bad. anyone listening, I hope it wasn't that bad. Now, um, I try to keep it very objective. Let's go into the adventure part of this whole thing. Now, Mm. what makes your specific career so intriguing to me is that there's some adventures where they, out of their own choice, they decide to go into danger, go into the unknown, and go on some kind of journey. There's other people who do it for a living, right? There's skydivers, there's extreme adventurers, and then there's researchers who they literally have to do this for a living and you're not like there's no no one's at the top of mount logan collecting this data so you have to go up there and do that and now i know with you specifically this is fortunately this is something you enjoy so taking off the research lens and putting on the adventure lens what what is it like from your job having that freedom to go on these kinds of journeys and do you do you treat it as work or is it, or is it enjoyable? And, and how would, like, how do you prepare for that? Mm. I mean, not just Mount Logan, but some of the other adventures you've done with other research endeavors. Yeah. Thanks for that question. I think, um, I really have to say until this past year, the, um, my ice coring expedition on Logan, I've, I have never before really so seamlessly brought these two things together. Um, I mean, through grad school, through my postdoc, through starting my faculty position, I basically would bugger off and do my expeditions or I was a guide and a, a, a climbing ranger. And, you know, I would, I would do those things on, on my own time. And then I'd come back and do my research, even though my research was, you know, at the poles and, and had a field component. Um, sure. Right. But they still, I still felt like they were separate, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, truly, Lo- this Logan project is the first time they really did come together, and um, I just want to keep doing it. I, it's all I want to do now. I, I mean, it was I had <laughs> like I had to climb Logan to be able to drill an ice core on top of it, and <laughs> happen to have the the right background to do it. So it just felt like, like uh, I'm playing to all of my strengths here. This is just it's all come together finally. Um, yeah, and I you know, it's, it was kind of cool because it happens in stages, right? Like um, to get a team up there and be able to work at high altitudes, like I had to, you know, take a team up Logan. Um, so we spent, you know, the first, the first two weeks climbing a big mountain and that was just pure expedition style, the way anyone would climb Logan if they're going just for fun. Um, so, you know, it was just, just expedition, you know, for the start of it. And then but then it, boom, once we went up and over Prospector Call and got up onto the summit plateau, then it's all science all the time. <laughs> <Just> science <laughs> mode kicks in. Not really. Like you're still, you know, kind <laughs> of an expedition science, mode. Yeah. But yeah. 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 So, so how do you get that? I've been trying to think about this for a while. How do you get all of the stuff up there? Like, because it's, I'm oh. assuming it's a, it's a fairly large drill, right? Or is it just like a little hand drill or something? <laughs> I don't know. I know that's a foolish question, but no, it's cool. Um, <laughs> no, it's 900 pounds. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so we climbed like normally when I climb, I had climbed Logan before. Um, I generally, you know, we climbed with the normal, I don't know what the average is, probably 75 pounds per person kind of thing. Um, but you climbed, we climbed to be self-sufficient so that you know, people could turn around if they needed to, which they did, or, you know, you could climb all the way up there and get stuck in weather for two weeks before the drill showed up, you know, you had, so we still had to just treat it as a normal climbing expedition. But of course, the truth is you cannot carry a 900 pound drill and hundreds of pounds of fuel and a, I don't know how heavy generator, um, like the drill equipment had to get flown. So there's, um, this is not a, a normal thing. Like this is usually reserved just for high altitude rescue, but there's one helicopter um, in that area, the Yukon that has uh, altitude mods and very experienced, incredible pilots with special altitude training and they fly with oxygen. 
Um, again, this is normally the kind of flying that is reserved for um, um, search and rescue and emergency situations, but um, but this was planned for years. So um, so they were on board, um, and and the way it looked basically was once we arrived at the summit plateau, um, we had pre-staged all of the the drill components and everything related to the drill equipment into 300 pound loads. Um, so at 20,000 feet, a helicopter can't carry more than 300 pounds. The payload is tiny. <laughs> yeah. um, so it slung from a low altitude um, down on a landing strip. It slung 300 pound loads up to the summit plateau. So right, the drill itself was three loads. Uh, the fuel was another two. The generator was one. Um, I had a floorless drill shelter sent up as well. And that with some other odds and ends was another one. So it was actually um, quite a bit of high altitude flying, which is risky in itself. Um, and, and you have to wait for weather windows in a place that's notorious for horrific weather um, and very high winds. So the flying really was something um, I would say we got, I mean, we would, we would have pulled it off no matter what, but we didn't have to wait around much. We did get lucky when we really needed good weather. We got it um, on the days that I really needed ice flown off or equipment come in, it was able to happen. Um, but yeah, the other thing was that of course, everything that got flown up had to get flown off in addition to 327 meters of ice, which weighs over 2000 pounds. Um, so it was an enormous amount of flying to get everything off the plateau. Um, yeah. And, and how long were you guys actually up there? Like doing, I mean, there's the setup of the equipment and the drill, but also like, I'm, I'm assuming you were up there. It took two weeks to drill. Okay. And, 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 and it's still, and once you have it set up, like you just let it, let it run and collect, right? Like you don't, there's no oh, reason no. for you to. It's a manual drill. It takes a minimum of three people. Yeah, so the drill, the drill oh, itself man. is very like physically hard to operate. Uh, I, I mean, not very, but at altitude, I would say it is. Um, uh, you can do it with two people, but three or four is really better. Um, and there were only a few of us. Um, there were only a few of us up there, so we were, we kind of opted for this schedule where we we broke into two teams so that we could rest a little bit. The altitude was really a lot over time and we would drill in kind of three hour sessions and swap off swap off um to keep the drill running from for about 12 to 12 to 14 hours a day um but no it's it's a very physical job yeah i i mean it, it seems almost like i mean you would know because you've you've been up there before but like how does that how does that trek compare to other for fun um a sense when it, it maybe not Logan, but like in general, like other, yeah, it's I don't other. know. Cause I don't really know much about the, the terrain or the, the, yeah. like the climbing conditions or anything of it, but yeah, you know, Logan, um, is really special. Like it's, I'm, I've climbed, um, a couple of times in the Indian Himalaya and, um, I've climbed way higher than Logan and I, and you know Denali and Aconcagua and other peaks that you would think maybe would be sort of similar, um, either because they're similar in altitude or character. Mm -hmm. But Logan, um, for a whole host of reasons, um, has given me the hardest time. <laughs> I've been I've luckily been successful each time, but maybe not luckily stubbornly. <laughs> but it's just so enormous. Um, sort of the distances between where you generally put each camp are so much bigger um, than a, a good a good example to kind of put it against would be Denali because they're almost the same altitude they're very close to right. each other um, and Logan is just uh, is just so much harder um, but it's also it's also changing at like compared to between five and 10 years ago, the route, just the, stand, the standard mountaineering route is very different. And some of the lower ice falls, um, there's, a, there's one low ice fall and then there's King Call ice fall. And they both are, are definitely changing as the glaciers are speeding up and the ice falls themselves are sort of thinning and becoming more mobile. So yeah, what was truly just a ski up the first time I climbed Logan was like quite, a, it was a navigational puzzle um, last year. 
Like there That's was one, one way through it. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a different way on the way down. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> and from what I've heard, like the descent is on, like a lot of times that's harder than going up, right? I've never it, climbed. It certainly can be. Um, we had a great ski down. It was very fast. We think we did it in under seven hours. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it can especially <laughs> especially some of the ice falls are, can be committing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's that's so cool. That it's um, it's just wild that it's like at the end of the day, all this is is contributing in a in a publication context or or, or like an academic context. You know, like you're. <laughs> You're flying down a mountain, yeah. like you know. Just, I don't know. I don't know how fa- how fast do you think you've uh, you ever just tuck and go, just see how fast you can go. Down no, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not that good of a skier. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's true. I mean, I think that's why it felt so good for like this all to come together. You know, like doing like doing the physical things in these places. I love to be t- resulting in high impact science is amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Now, uh, if I remember from your talk, that that data specifically is going to be publicly available. Well, it will no? be once we publish it. Um, right, maybe right, what right, you're yeah. thinking of is the we installed a weather station at eighteen oh, and a half it, thousand it. feet, and that is available. It has been available actually since um, since we installed the station in May of 2021. Um, yep, it's on a website. It gets updated every few minutes. Um, it oh, communicates in real time, and anyone can use that data. Yeah, awesome. All right. So what about this trip to Tuck to Yuck Tuck? Ooh. That's, I, I, I read a little bit about that, but I feel like you're the best person, obviously, to give us the background. So what was like the, what was the trip? What, what was kind of the impetus for it? And I didn't know you knew about that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, most of the larger slash dumber things I've done in my life have been with the same two women, um, <laughs> Rebecca Haspel and Kate Harris. And, um, much like previous expeditions, this was Kate's idea. Um, so, uh, gosh, I can't remember the year, but, um, the, the driving force behind biking in the middle of winter from Dawson to talk to Yuck Tuck was because it was the last year that the ice road was going to be maintained. And the year before the Anuvik Tuck road was going to be put in. Um, so there's an ice, there's ice roads all over the place, but um, this particular ice road, which is at the end of that journey between Anuvik and Tuck, um, is just frozen Arctic Ocean that's maintained as a road. And it starts on the Mackenzie and the Mackenzie River and then just goes out into the ocean. Um, and you cross the Arctic Ocean and hit this little town, Tuck to Tuck. <laughs> so we wanted to do it the last year that it was possible. Um, also Kate just thinks it's hilarious. I think to find things that Rebecca and I are not good at. Um, I had never bike packed and this was like probably the most difficult bike packing scenario, um, that she could (laughs) come up with. Uh, it was like definitely funny for a day or two as Rebecca figured out our systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, And it was like Um, pretty, what was the temperature? It was pretty, it was like fairly far below zero, right? It was sustained minus thirties with very high winds. (laughs) Um, and we did it Dawson to tuck. So we were ba- like toward the ocean, right? So we had headwind the whole, the whole way. It was super cold. I, I have to say actually of, of the things I've done, that might be some of the coldest I've ever been because even in minus thirties, minus forties, being on the Arctic ocean, it's still somehow like wet. Like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the humidity is high, which just kills you. Like it, it just, <laughs> It was brutal. That's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> what's what was like the total? What was the total uh, distance? Yeah, it's about a. Oh, so it says yeah, it was about a thousand kilometers, but it's not really because if you if you looked at a map right now, which <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't done that, it doesn't show the way we went because you can't do it anymore. <laughs> that makes it no, that makes that. it even more unique. Yeah. You know? Well, that's cool. Any any polar bears? Any uh, interesting encounters or anything? No, no interesting encounters. So, you know, some Just, very curious people wondering yeah. what was wrong with us. But, um, <laughs> yeah. No, but not much wildlife on that one. It was really beautiful. So in all your experiences with academia and beyond, what would you say was the most impactful for how you, how you live your life going forward? Like which of all of these adventures, oh, wow. which one do you think really made you a 
better, more resilient, forward thinking person. Wow. Because you got a lot. Really you got a lot of, you got quite the resume to choose from. So <laughs> thanks. That is a, a really cool question. I wish I could have thought about before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that's jumping to mind is actually an expedition that I did with Kate and Rebecca that was probably the hardest. And technically, the only one I think I've done where we didn't, we truly didn't do what we set out to do because um, it wasn't possible. Um, but it was this, it was a ski we called border ski. We were skiing the border of Tajikistan with Afghanistan, China, and Kyrgyzstan. Um, well, that was the idea. Um, and we skied a bunch of the Afghan border near the Wakhan corridor. Um, and we tried to ski a bunch of the Chinese border, but had a very difficult time um, because it was fenced and armed. And, and we did ski a bunch of the Kyrgyz border, but it was sort of a trip that was broken up in unexpected ways because of you know political unrest and all sorts of other things that we couldn't have anticipated. And I got, I got really sick on that expedition as well. Um, so it's sort of, there were other struggles too, but I think, you know, it, it was so foreign to me. I mean, like skiing on the border of Afghanistan, it's like three North Americans, um, in <laughs> just so, so out there on our own and then coming against up against obstacles that I really hadn't foreseen. I, I, I sort of, it's funny because I think I went in with some preconceived notions thinking if we had issues, they might be on the Afghan border, but in fact, they were along the Chinese border. And there was just something about the whole trip that was unexpected and very, very hard for me that I guess on the other side of it, I'd probably say had the biggest impact on me. What did you learn? Like what, what was like the, if you were to boil it all down to like one takeaway that you could tell your kids or, or whoever. We're more resilient than I think we know. When, yeah. when we're pushed to be yeah cool then as a follow-up question what is your advice to starry-eyed young people who see what you do and they're inspired and they want to go climb up the highest mountain or go to space or do something that seems insurmountable they want to do it but they don't have the courage to do it or they there's just something holding them back. What do you say to people like that? Find that thing that's holding you back and get rid of it. You know, she's going to kill me for saying this in public space. Rebecca, the person who's done all these things with me, um, I had to convince her to do that. She's so much stronger than I am. She's a better skier. She's a better climber. She's she's just, and I, I each of these things had to convince her you can do this. Like, why didn't she know that? Um, I think I've thought about that many times in my life. Um, and it's just a mindset thing. And I, I would say much like I said to her, uh, like what, just go for it. Like what is the actual worst thing that's going to happen? And especially if you feel like, Oh, there's some, like there's some objective or some, something I want to do somewhere I want to get to, but I don't actually have like the safe skills to get there. Well, then, then grow those. Yeah. Like then you can get there. There's a path there. And also there's a lot of power in the people and partners we pick to, to get, you know, to do certain objectives. And so, so be really thoughtful about, about who you're learning with and just go for it. Yeah. That's, that's a, I, I think s surrounding yourself with the right encouraging people, kind of like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, very apropos since you climb mountains that you don't again i've never climbed a mountain so i wouldn't know but you can verify what i'm saying you don't really want to focus on the top you just want to focus on kind of your six foot radius of like what you can control and it just keep chipping away one rock at a time just keep going up and then you know when you're at the top you look down you see all that you've accomplished and it just blows your mind totally i mean everything gets broken down into small bits which is uh you know of course you could say about a lot of things but um but yeah really big big things become achievable when we break them down into into smaller pieces and just chip them away yeah yeah so i'm gonna 
I'm going to end it on a philosophical note here. Given that this is the Adventures Less Traveled podcast, what does adventure mean to you? How would you define it? Because there is, from the people that I've talked to and the things that I've done and the things that I've read, it seems that there's not a universal definition. For someone who lives in New York City, that might be going mm. to Mount Everest. For a Sherpa in Mount Everest, that might be crossing the street in New York City. So everyone kind of has their mm. own, everyone has their own definition of adventure. How do you personally define adventure? God, I love this. Um, <laughs> I want to say anything, anything I that I do outside in a where there's some unknown. Although there's some leeway with that, right? Like I can have a, a great adventure, even if I already know the route and I've done it before somewhere. But but there's just there's a big enough level of unknown. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could do the same route over and over again and there's an avalanche or there's, you know. Well, thank you. This was fantastic. <laughs> Your resume speaks volumes for everything that you've done and, and the adventures and the research, more importantly, most importantly. But I really thank you for your time today. And this is a great conversation. And I'm, I am I look forward to all of the Mount Logan research that comes out of this and all your future endeavors. And, and I, I really genuinely thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for finding me. I, you asked great questions. I, that was a really fun talk. Yeah, of course. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.